SLT Fiber and experience the power of fiber technology. Sri Lanka's only super fast internet connection. SLT Fiber. Call 1212 now. Tonight, friends and benefits. Basil Rajpaksha says India is best friend, but China important to the country's development and a new constitution, only if people want it. Sajid says, United National Front presidential candidate promises war on drugs, a real war hero for law and order and boon for estate workers. Growth slowdown. World Bank report reveals economic slowdown for 2019, but recovery on the horizon next year. At the moment, the economy in South Asia is sharply slowing down. That's in line with the global downturn, but the slowdown in South Asia is sharper. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Monday, the 14th of October, 2019. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. Fair and lovely men, they have to pass. Marks are to villa, fairness, very villa. Marks are to curl up. We are a fairness standard. Take a very curragan. Fair and lovely men, anti marks cream. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamma Gekanaka. Let's start with your local stories. National organizer of the Sri Lanka, Pudhijana Peramuna Basil Rajapaksha, has hinted on what the country's foreign policy would be under Gotabe Rajapaksha government. Labeling India as Sri Lanka's number one friend and neighbor, he added that the country's political and security matters will always have to be aligned with India's as a matter of principle. In an interview, the former minister, however, did not forget China either, highlighting the importance of the superpower in the economic sphere. Four years down the line since the last presidential election, with Sri Lanka set to go for polls to elect its seventh executive president, national organizer of the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna, Basil Rajpaksha, is confident that no international actor will attempt to interfere in the looming election. In an interview with an Indian media outlet, he said, ethically, that is what it should be, touching on the possible involvement of India in the past presidential poll. The SLPP national organizer added that he personally doesn't have evidence of India or any other country supporting the opposition coalition back in 2015. He followed that up by saying, what went wrong back then is very well understood and if they had worked to change the government earlier, the situation now has been corrected. The former minister also said, quote, India is our number one friend and neighbour, so we have to always go with India in political and security matters, but in economic and other matters, you can't forget China, unquote. He is also quoted saying that his target is 6.5 million votes in the upcoming election and that it is important to connect with people on the ground as numbers are only for targets. The article also says that Basil Rajpaksha identified votes of the minority communities as very important and that Sri Lanka's people should decide if they need a new constitution or not, deeming a referendum necessary. Presidential hopeful of the Sri Lanka Potijana Perumuna Gautabe Rajapaksha himself, meanwhile, picked holes in the country's education system as he lamented the lack of decision makers while addressing a campaign rally. As the former Defence Secretary's campaign gathers momentum, leader of the opposition, Mahinda Rajapaksha, expressed confidence that the result of the presidential election will not differ from the recently concluded Alpiti local authority poll, adding that the UNP will suffer a remarkable defeat at the hands of the SLPP. The Yapahu electorate meeting of the Sri Lanka Podijana Peramuna was conducted this morning. Presidential contender of the party, Gotabe Rajpaksha, was warmly welcomed by the people. Bombs began to go off once again in this country due to the weakness of this government, its destruction of the security apparatus and its paralyzing of the intelligence services. But under our government, we will provide that security once again and make this country safe once more. <laughs> Being a second row, Jiwa, then Napoleon, Rata Kadaladi, Buapi, 
We built a country without fear, but ultimately we are living in fear again. The entire country is living in fear for their lives and we have to prepare ourselves to change the situation. I'm certain that the people of this country will not allow a Premadasa era once again. For the first time in history, the UNP has experienced a drop of 24% during the LPT election. It was Sajid Premadasa who was at the forefront of this campaign. The first election he held was a failure. The result of the presidential election will not differ much from the LPT election. Meanwhile, former Defence Secretary Gautabe Rajpaksha held a meeting with private tuition teachers in Colombo yesterday. When I was the Defence Secretary, I received a letter saying that 800 graduates will be directed to my ministry. What would I do with 800 graduates within the ministry? We cannot allow such recruitment. It's common knowledge that some ministers boast of providing three to 4,000 jobs. But I haven't heard a single minister say that they created 5,000 jobs. The jobs they provide have zero economic importance, nor do they have any social importance. What is the point of working at a job for 20,000 rupees? This is not the education system we need. Our education system has not taught our youth to take risks. That is how it has been since childhood for them, where parents don't let them fall or climb a tree. They are not given the space to improve their skills. If they go on to become ministers, they will still fear being decisive. So there is no point in such ministers. We did not hire mercenaries to end the conflict. It was our own army. But why did it take 30 years? Because the people in positions of power could not be decisive. I explained to President Mahindra Rajpaksa that we need an army of at least 500,000 in order to end this war. He understood that and ordered P.B. Jayasundara to provide the necessary financial assistance to finish this war. Many previous leaders were afraid to take this decision for many years. Mahindra Rajapaksa made this decision and that is the quality of a true leader. Now, TNA parliamentarian S. Vyalendran today came forward to pledge his support to Gautabe Rajpaksa at the upcoming presidential poll. Convening a media briefing in Batiklo this morning, the parliamentarian assured the support of the Tamil community in the East for the former Defence Secretary. A special gathering of the SLPP-led coalition to discuss election campaigning in the Colombo district was held at the opposition leader's office this morning. Representatives of several parties, including the Sri Lanka Podhijana Peramun and Sri Lanka Freedom Party, joined the discussions. At the time when the SLFP joined us, the joint opposition and its sister parties anyway had a program in place for the Colombo district. Today we made a decision as to what the SLFP's role would be in this and we had a very cordial discussion. On another note, Tamil National Alliance parliamentarian S. Vyalendran today pledged his support to the presidential candidate of the Sri Lanka Puddhijana Peramuna, Gotabe Rajpaksa. We will support Gotabe Rajpaksa in the upcoming presidential election. The Tamil people of the East are ready to support him and we support Gotabe Rajapaksa due to the massive development projects initiated by Mahindra Rajapaksa. Meanwhile, the Sri Lanka Podhijana Peramuna convened a media briefing at the party headquarters in Battarmulla today. UMP leader Ranil Vikramasinghe asked its candidate Sajid Premadasa to take over the responsibility of the LPT election campaign. While taking over, Finance Minister Mangal Samaravira called 17 cabinet ministers and assigned them each a division and provided them with financing. Each of these ministers brought roofing sheets, cement blocks and baby products, including cash as well. Those people accepted those things but still voted for the SLPP. We won all 17 divisions. A letter has been released from the Ministry of Health and Indigenous Medicine on the 1st of October 2019, announcing job interviews yesterday, which happened to be a poor day at the Ministry Cafeteria. We will direct this to the Election Commissioner for legal action. In the meantime, parliamentarian Bandula Gunavardhana welcomed the representatives of the SLFP who pledged their support to Gautabe Rajpaksha at the party's Homagam election office this afternoon. Hello, 
Now in the other camp, Minister Sajid Premadasi yet again echoed his own pledge to appoint former commander of the Sri Lanka Army MP Sarat Fonseca as the Minister of Law and Order once he becomes Sri Lanka's top citizen. Presidential hopeful of the New Democratic Front reiterated his call, kicking off his election campaign in the Ratnapura district today. There were two more similar rallies yesterday where Premadasa promised to tackle the issue of drugs head-on without trepidation. An election campaign rally of presidential hopeful of the new Democratic Front, Minister Sajid Premadasa, kicked off in the Haliela town last afternoon. Under a garment of Sajid Premadasa, no person who destroyed state resources and properties will be allowed to stay. Some fear for their lives in talking about the long-term issue of the drug menace. Sajid Premadasa would never be hesitant to sacrifice one life to save thousands. Minister Premadasa later attended another election campaign rally in the Atalava. The Department of Census and Statistics says that a family with four members must at least earn 55,000 rupees to survive each month. Calculate the amount of money the estate workers receive every month. I will surely offer a reasonable salary to them once I am the President of Sri Lanka. In the meantime, Minister Premadasa commenced his presidential campaign in the Ratnapura district today by attending the first district campaign rally in Balangoda. After the presidential election, I will stop the re-exportation of pepper completely. I assure you that I am the most original candidate in this presidential race. I will unite this nation with your support. We don't want any bogeymen to govern our country. It is because of my policies that all other parties are joining hands with me. We don't have any cash deals. We don't have enough money for it either. It is with much financial difficulty that we are conducting this election campaign. I have never been involved in corruption. The true war hero of this country will be appointed the Law and Order Minister to strengthen national security. In the meantime, Minister Ravi Karunanayak is confident that presidential candidate of the New Democratic Front will secure an electoral percentage between 55 to 57 to ensure his win at the presidential election. He expressed these views at a media briefing held at the UNP headquarters today. The presidential election special task force office of the United National Party was declared open at the party headquarters in Colombo today. It was declared open by the UNP assistant leader, Minister Ravi Karunanayak. We say the same thing in Colombo, Badiklo, Trincomalee and Hambantota. We ask whether any other political party could do the same. They make different statements at different places to different individuals. We are much more open and we will continue to do so. In the meantime, non-cabinet minister Ajit P. Pereira filed a complaint at the election commission today. In every weekend newspaper, a promotional post of presidential candidate of the SLPP, Gotabi Rajapaksa, has been carried with the use of photos and statements by the current army commander as well as retired army officers. This is a clear violation of the election code of conduct. We brought this to the attention of the chairman of the elections commission. Uh, Presidential candidate of the National People's Power parliamentarian Anurakumara Desanayaka reveals that in addition to students, teachers too will be made a priority as part of his education policy. Addressing an event held in Colombo today, the presidential hopeful also said that the larger share of the responsibility of educating the country's future generations will be borne by the state, thereby lessening the burden on parents. 
The education policy of the National People's Power was unveiled to the public in Colombo today under the patronage of its presidential candidate, parliamentarian Anura Kumara Disanayaka. Themed as Hope for a Smarter Country, the education policy compiled by university lecturers was officially handed over to the presidential hopeful. It is the parents who are carrying most of the weight of this highly pressurized education system. This is why it is our goal to transfer that weight from the parents to the state. Students go to school for only 13 years, while teachers remain there for 30 years. Therefore, it is important to focus on teachers as much as we do with students. There should be refresher training programs for teachers at least every five years, so their knowledge will be constantly updated. Teaching has become a freelance job, which is also a government job with very low salaries. This career should be upgraded to be one of the top 10 in the country. Members of the Vyat Mag organization, or member rather, Major General Kamal Gunaratna called on the public to make the right choice at the upcoming presidential election on the 16th of November. The former Vani Security Forces commander made this request during the Badula District Conference yesterday. We are the true owners of this country, while its leaders are just custodians. But none of the leaders in this government were able to make national security their priority. As a result, over 290 victims lost their lives. For weeks afterwards, there were empty houses in the vicinity of the Katwapitiya church because all the residents were dead. And then, everybody rushed to put the blame on the Defence Secretary and IGP and washed their hands of the responsibility. The army commander, who is supposed to take most of the blame, went on to become a presidential candidate. Things get destroyed when we conduct acid tests on them. But the result would be different if it can withstand the test. The acid test of our nation will come on the 16th of November. We must therefore be vigilant. The finance minister said during the disabled soldiers' protests that they don't have money trees growing at the finance ministry. He then went on to say that he could have distributed all the money if that was the case. There were indeed metaphorical money trees in this country before. There were intelligent people who were growing those money trees. Avant-Garde Private Limited was one such money tree. Police today opened fire on a vehicle when it didn't stop when asked to. Details coming up after this break. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, one person was hospitalized with injuries after police opened fire at a vehicle which had failed to heed orders to stop in Arivial Nagar of Kilinochi at around 6.20 this morning. A team had been dispatched based on information received by officers of the Kilinochi Division Anti-Vice Unit that a large stock of cannabis is being transported in this vehicle. The police team had repeatedly ordered the suspicious vehicle to stop. However, the vehicle had reportedly ignored orders and continued on its way. This had prompted the police officers to open fire at the SUV, resulting in injuries to one of the passengers of the vehicle who was admitted to the Kilinochi hospital. Later, however, it was revealed that several officers from the Kabitigol Lab Excise Unit were travelling in the vehicle in question. Kilinochi Police is conducting further investigations. In more local news, police have recovered two claymore mines from Kondaville in Jaffna based on information provided by the former LTT Kada who was recently arrested in Serunwara. The police spokesperson said that the claymore mines, also known as side charges, weighed 15 kilograms each and were found buried. The discovery was made based on information uncovered through the interrogation of Joseph Peter Robinson, a former LTT Kada arrested by security forces and handed over to Serunwara police on Friday. Following the search of the suspect's house in Kilinochi, police discovered a stock of weapons, ammunition and explosives while the suspect's wife and sister were also taken into custody. The suspects have been handed over to the Terrorism Investigation Division for further investigations. Now, Indian High Commissioner to Sri Lanka Taranjit Singh Sandhu, while reiterating India's continued support to Sri Lanka, highlighted the increase in September Indian tourist arrivals as a result of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's post-Easter attack solidarity visit as the best example of the special relationship the countries share. The Indian High Commissioner made these comments addressing the scientific community at the RESCON 2019 Research Congress held at the University of Peradeniya recently. 
Indian High Commissioner Taranjit Singh Sandhu spoke recently on the special ties shared by India and Sri Lanka, highlighting the many people-oriented development assistance projects undertaken by the Indian government, whilst revealing that three times more Indian tourists arrived in the country in September than from its second highest traditional source market. I would like to reiterate that for India, Sri Lanka is special. You will be surprised to note that the Indian housing project in Sri Lanka is the largest grant assistance project of Government of India in any country abroad. Similarly, we have constructed the largest university auditorium in Sri Lanka in the University of Ruhana. You may also have heard about the 1990 emergency ambulance funded by India, which is now operational island-wide. Our development partnership with Sri Lanka is based on Sri Lanka's own priority. Our projects are people-oriented. They have a direct impact on the life of common people. From north to south and west to east, it is spread all over the island. India will continue to stand with you in your journey ahead. Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, was the first world leader to visit Sri Lanka after the Easter attacks. This has been also an important messaging and you can see the difference it has made. Indian tourists are back in big numbers in Sri Lanka, driving all the supply chains in the Sri Lankan economy. In fact, if you look at the most recent September arrival figures, Indian tourist arrivals in Sri Lanka are around three times the numbers from the second highest source market. You will find us whenever you need us. Espousing the benefits of a decentralized economy, the World Bank's biannual report, South Asia Economic Focus, Making Decentralization Work, projects Sri Lanka's 2019 growth to slow down to 2.7% owing to recent security setbacks and as a result of slow regional growth. However, the report projects a recovery in 2020 and 2021 with the dissipation of political uncertainty, a stabilization of security and investment and export recovery and will steadily push growth to 3 3.3% and 3.7% respectively. Presenting the report's findings, World Bank Chief Economist for South Asia, Hans Timmer, revealed in line with global trends, growth in South Asia is projected to slow to 5.9%, a 1.1 percentage point decrease from April 2019 estimates pointing to uncertainty in the short term. The report also pointed to a weakening of strong domestic demand that previously propped up growth, driving the slowdown in the region. A 15-20% to 20 contraction of imports in Sri Lanka and Pakistan was also high highlighted, while domestic demand in India was reported to have slipped in the last quarter, causing manufacturing growth to plummet to below 1% in the second quarter of 2019. At the moment, the economy in South Asia is sharply slowing down. That's in line with the global downturn, but the slowdown in South Asia is sharper. This slowdown reinforces problems that already existed, for example, in Pakistan, it comes on top of the macroeconomic crisis that they already had. In India, it comes on top of the problems in the financial markets. In Sri Lanka, it comes on top of weak tourism as a result of the Eastern bombings. Growth potential in South Asia is still strong, but the timing of the rebound back to that high growth potential is very uncertain at the moment. South Asian economies are all decentralizing further at the moment as they are becoming more complex. To make decentralization work, we need more empowerment of the local governments and we need a strong central government that can ensure a level playing field. Now taking a look at the markets, stocks rose for the seventh straight session today to hit a near six-week high as beverages and banking shares rallied. The all share price index ended 0.61% firmer at 5,870.09, its highest close since the 3rd of September. Foreign investors, meanwhile, continued selling for the ninth straight session, accounting for a net 204 million rupees worth of shares, extending the year-to-date net foreign outflow to 3.95 billion rupees of equities. Now here's a brief report on today's market performance. The secondary bond market witnessed a continued buying interest during the day, while overall market witnessed a moderate volume. And beginning of the week, stock market started on a positive note. Market concluded in the day on the green price gained by HNB and distilleries, recording a nearly one and a half month high. And 25% of the turnover derived through a crossings in Silinco Insurance and Greg. And while net foreign outflow witnessed for the ninth straight session with a low foreign participation. 
Taking a look at currencies, the rupee was 0.14 percent, weak at 180 rupees and 90 cents to 181 rupees and 10 cents against the US dollar, compared with Friday's close of 180 rupees and 65 to 75 cents. Now, here's uh, let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee traded against other major currencies around the world. We take a look at what's happening around the world after this short break. Don't go away. Tens of thousands of troops and rescue workers worked throughout today to save stranded residents and fight floods caused by one of the worst typhoons to hit Japan in recent history. At least 40 people were killed in the typhoon that left vast sections of towns in central and eastern Japan underwater, with another 16 missing. Typhoon Hagibis, which paralyzed Tokyo on Saturday and dumped record levels of rain around Japan, also left around about 100,000 homes without power. Some of the worst damage hit the central Japanese city of Nagano, where the Chikuma River inundated swaths of land and forced military helicopters to airlift people from homes. Typhoon Hagibis, which means speed in the Philippine language of Tagalog, made landfall on Japan's main island of Honshu on Saturday evening and headed out to sea early yesterday. Now, the Syrian government forces have begun arriving in the northeast of the country hours after the government agreed to help Kurdish forces counter the Turkish incursion. Syrian state media reported that government forces entered Ionisa today, 30 kilometers south of the Turkish border. The deal came after the U.S. After the U.S., the Kurds' main ally said it would withdraw its remaining troops from northern Syria. Turkey began an offensive in the region last week, aimed to pushing Kurdish forces from the border region. Areas under the control of the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces came under heavy bombardment over the weekend, with Turkey making gains in two key border towns. Dozens of civilians and fighters have been killed on both sides. The U.S. announced yesterday that it was preparing to evacuate its 1,000 remaining soldiers from northern Syria. Now, China's president has issued a warning against a dissident saying any attempt to divide China will end in bodies smashed and bones ground to powder. China said broadcaster said that Xi Jinping's comments came during a state visit to Nepal yesterday. The comments are seen as a warning to Hong Kong, where anti-Beijing protests have been ongoing for months. Peaceful rallies in Hong Kong yet again descended into clashes yesterday with public transport stations and shops deemed to be pro-Beijing being damaged. According to a foreign ministry statement issued yesterday, she had said that anyone who attempts to split re any region from China will perish with their bodies smashed and bones ground to powder. He added that any external forces that support the splitting of China can only be regarded as dissolutional by the Chinese people. Since the start of the Hong Kong protest movement four months ago, China has blamed external forces for fueling the unrest and accused the US and UK of interfering in Chinese domestic affairs. Coco Gauff of the US United States won the Linz Open Tennis Championship by defeating Elena Ostapenko of Latvia 6-3-1-6-6-2 to become the youngest winner of a WTA title in 15 years. This win of Gauff moves her ranking inside the top 75 of the world. Gauff only qualified for the main draw as a lucky loser after losing in the final round of qualifying. The youngster, who rose to fame at Wimbledon this year when she beat five-time champion Venus Williams in the first round, emulated Nicole Vydasova, who was 15 when she won her maiden WTA title in 2004. Kenyan Bridget Koske broke Paula Radcliffe's 16-year-old women's marathon world record, but former Alberta, uh, former Alberta Salazar coached athletes, including Mo Farah, were never a factor in the Chicago Marathon yesterday. 
25-year-old Koske set a blistering pace from the start to run 2 hours, 40 minutes and 4 seconds and shatter Radcliffe's previous record of 2 hours, 15 minutes and 25 seconds, which the Britons set in London in 2003. It adds to the Kenyan's win in London this year when she became the youngest winner of the race. Only 22 runners in the men's race finished faster than Koske, whose time would have been a men's world record in 1964. Radcliffe's time set in 2003 was the longest standing marathon world record by either men or women in the post-war era. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.